We're going to continue our Bible study in the Gospel of John. And we've now finished chapter one and we're going to begin chapter two where, well, there are two very distinctive incidents. Uh, firstly, Jesus at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and then an account of Jesus in Jerusalem. Now, these places are not particularly near one another uh, and we don't even think that they were chronologically linked. And yet John puts them together in his chapter two, right at this key point when the gospel is now getting going to tell the story of who Jesus was and most particularly why we should believe in him. Shall we pray? Our loving God, we do thank you. We thank you for the riches of your word. And as we come together, wherever we are, may we have a sense of being joined with others, asking you to grow that faith in us and indeed that understanding which may strengthen us, renew us, challenge us and move us to live, to live life to your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, um, I think we'll just go straight into the text if that's okay and we'll just read, we're going to certainly break it up into two and I think we're probably only going to do the first half uh, today. That's certainly what we did on Wednesday morning, uh, Wednesday afternoon. Um, but uh, we'll just do a tiny little dabbling at the very end, I think, into the second half. So let's, let's go to the text. John chapter two. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited for the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine, after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Well, let's uh, stop there. And uh, this is a, this is a well-known passage. I'm sure uh, uh, most of you, if not all, will have read it before. And what we did at the beginning when we were all together, and it's all the nice numbers are increasing uh, week by week uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, was that we just kind of shared a little bit about things that struck us in the passage or things that we have wondered about or, or what was being said there or what's this about. Just opening up the issues and, you know, in that group of, what, 14 of us, I think nearly every issue was named and uh, and brought up. And, you know, I, I'm obviously just going to launch into this monologue, but you might like, if you're watching this on your own, even just to stop the, the, the recording a bit and just reread this for yourself and just, yeah, look for what you are interested to find out about. Think about what strikes you and allow this to be, a, yes, a joint exercise in reading the Bible. So you don't have to, but you might like just to stop the recording now and do that. What I'll do then is talk us through how this works. At least, well, 
a way of thinking about how it works. The critical thing, and I just left on the, the end of the text uh, that we're looking at, uh, just to help us there, is that this is the, as it says in verse 11, the first of the signs through which Jesus revealed his glory. Well, actually, liter literally it says this was the beginning of the signs, the very same word that's used at the beginning of John's Gospel, actually, in the beginning was the word, yes? So the beginning of the signs is actually a rather critical thing because it is, yes, as John's Gospel tells us, the, the moment at which we really need to see why Jesus came into the world to reveal his glory, to make clear how how the blessing of God, how the very presence of God was upon him. And his disciples believed in him. Uh, even before we get to any of the detail, of course, we, we, we meet in this account of the wedding at Cana of Galilee, various other people, servants, the, the, the master of the feast, no doubt the, the bride and bridegroom and so on, all these other people. We're not told that they got exactly what was happening at this point. All that we're told is that the disciples, and perhaps there were only those five disciples who we've come across already in chapter one, it was perhaps only those five who really, who really began to see, began to see in what Jesus did at Cana of Galilee, a real sense of who he was, of how God was with him, of how God was in him. But in a way, we're jumping the gun because we've now, as it were, got to as it were, the conclusion, the, the rounding off of the tale. And so we better go back to the beginning. But just before we do so, I do want to underline how in John's Gospel, he does really have a very strong sense that the sign was the important thing. Now, the sign, the sign is not really quite the same as that word miracle that we quite often find ourselves using. Miracle, in its etymology and its derivation, really has a sense of a wow moment, my goodness. Wasn't that impressive? Wasn't that extraordinary? The kind of thing that, you know, almost every, every minister going to a, um, uh, to a wedding, uh, you know, the jokes get passed. Can't you turn the water into wine? <gasps> I'll be impressed. That was not what Jesus was doing at Cana of Galilee. In fact, uh, you know, even in the other Gospels, uh, the word most often used for what Jesus was doing when it was, yes, it was a bit, a bit wowish, but nevertheless, the, the language is really to insist that it was an act of power, dynamis in the Greek. And in John's Gospel, he likes this word sign, because sign has that sense of what you see is pointing to something else or pointing further along the way. It isn't the deal in itself. So, yes, okay, Jesus turned water into wine, but that's not really the story. The story is that Jesus revealed his glory. Jesus revealed how God was with him and in him. Let's go back to the, the beginning of the passage. On the third day, a wedding took place. Now, we, of course, some of us uh, who know our, 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 our gospel will think, oh, is that a reference to the resurrection? He rose again from the dead on the third day. Is John somehow hinting about that? Well, maybe, but maybe not, actually. Interestingly, if you read John's gospel and his account of the crucifixion and the resurrection, that phrase on the third day, actually doesn't really figure very much. It does figure in the other Gospels, but it doesn't really have quite the same nuance in John's Gospel. At least it's not such a big deal. It's not the, the prophecy uh, around Daniel that gets uh, uh, emphasised. And so maybe it's not about that on the third day. In fact, if we go back in the account, we have a sense that what we're dealing with is something, something a little bit more interesting almost. Um, if we go back a bit, let's go right back to verse 19. Chronology starts when John bore witness to Jesus' coming. 
So John gave his testimony in verse 19. Sorry, uh, on the screen it says verse 9, but uh, it's verse 19. And then John having given his witness, we then say, you see in verse 28, this all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. Then verse 29, the next day. So let's call what John was doing, the Baptist, I mean, uh, day one. Day two begins in verse 29. Then we get to verse 35. You'll see that the next day. So there we're on to day three. Now, that was the day when, when John the Baptist's two disciples uh, went off to follow Jesus and we're told that their names were, well, we're only told that one of their names, uh, uh, Andrew. And um, But we are told that those disciples spent the rest of the day with Jesus and it was about four in the afternoon when they first saw him. So, so day three kind of gets used up there. And when we're told that the first thing in verse 41 that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon, we can only presume that that was the next day, yes? So we're now on to day four. So there's day four. And then in verse 43, we've got the next day again. So that's day five. Now that's when uh, Philip was found and then also Nathaniel. So having had those five days, we then get to the beginning of chapter two and they're still in Cana of Galilee. In fact, we're told uh, at the very end of um, John's Gospel, if we're in any, any doubt, that the Nathaniel, who we had figuring uh, at the end of chapter one, Nathaniel was Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee. Yes, uh, we're told that in chapter 21 of John's Gospel. So they're in Cana on the fifth day. And then on the third day after the fifth day, now the way you count it is day five is day one, as it were, and day six would be day two and day seven would be day three, the third day would be day seven. On the third day, a wedding took place. I think, <coughs> the commentators think, that what's being signalled here is in a sense John saying, almost in the fullness of time, at the end of the week, on the Sabbath in a sense, at the end of all time, in glory, there is a sense that we have of a wedding. A wedding feast. Now, uh, there's a hint of that even at the very beginning of the book of Genesis, when even in the Garden of Eden, it's a man and a woman together, given one to one another. And at the very end of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, there's lots about the wedding feast and the, the bride and the bridegroom. And Jesus, actually, in chapter 3 of John's Gospel, will describe himself as a bridegroom. So, I don't think that the commentators, the scholars who are asking us to see a little bit below the surface here are just imagining it. I've said before that John's Gospel works both at, as it were, at a relatively shallow level, a, a straightforward level, telling the story as it was. But as we can think about the story as it was, as we can think about the things that happened, there was in a sense a sign, a sign of what it pointed to on a much larger canvas. So, in other words, John's Gospel, by telling us the account of what happened, happened at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, an ordinary human event, is also opening up to us a sense of us all being able to anticipate the wedding feast of the Lamb, the time when people will come from north and south and east and west and feast at the table in the kingdom of God. Now, uh, we don't want to push this too, too far, but I think it is interesting for us just to allow ourselves to meditate on, is it just about one wedding, once upon a time, some ordinary guys and a wee bit of a show? Or is it actually pointing to something much bigger? The wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited. We talked a little bit about wonder whose wedding it was. We don't know, but clearly there was some family connection. There must have been some family connection. So does that explain when in verse 3, when the wine runs out, that Jesus' mother gets a bit agitated? Probably it does. Um, 
to have wine run out at a wedding in those days, you know, they wouldn't have had a bar where people would have gone and served themselves. The whole notion was hospitality, generosity, extravagance. Um, Jesus' mother, for whatever reason, is, is, is a bit agitated. Uh, she just makes a statement. It's not clear that she has any solution particularly in mind, but she certainly makes a statement. They have no more wine. And there is potentially some shame coming in the direction of the, the bride and the groom and maybe uh, their parents. So I wonder if Mary was related to their parents, I wonder. Um, now, nevertheless, that kind of ordinary observation, that totally understandable observation by the mother of Jesus, is taken by Jesus as a, well, is it a challenge or a question? Or a desire for him to do something. Yeah, we did talk about that when we were all together. Um, clearly Mary had had a sense from Jesus's birth, from before Jesus's birth, that something was was moving, that uh, that God was moving in the world. And it's hard to know, and I think probably we shouldn't speculate for any terribly long time whether Mary expected Jesus to be able to do something about the wine shortage. Um, in a way it's a slightly strange thing for Mary to want Jesus to do something about. I mean given that we're all told a little bit later in the passage that the guests had already had quite a lot of wine anyway. <laughs> Maybe the reason why the drunk had run out was because they were having quite a, a good bevy as we would say in Scotland, uh, drinking away. Um, so is it really quite the thing for God to supply people who are already almost drunk with yet more wine? Is that the big deal for God acting in the world? It's a slightly strange request in a way, if you think about it. But um, let's just go with it. Mary observes they have no wine. And Jesus comes back to her. Now, it's what Jesus says in, re in response. It clearly is the, the interesting and significant thing and perhaps underlies why this gets called the beginning of the signs. Because Jesus seems to respond in a, in a tone of almost rebuke. Now, it's hard to be sure about this because, um, well, to start with, he calls her a woman, but I don't think that's really so much of a problem, even though it sounds slightly strange for somebody to call their mother a woman. Um, there's no way out of this in the Greek, it just says woman. Um, People have looked for parallel texts in other literature of the time. Did people ever call their, their wives or their mothers women in an affectionate way? Well, actually, yes, we did find one or two texts that they sort of did that. But let, let's maybe not linger on that too much. Um, I think, actually, maybe the issue is slightly different. Uh, woman is woman as opposed to man. And in other words, someday you are a human being woman, yes? So let's just hold that a second. You as a human being are asking me to do what? I think is what Jesus is saying, yes? So he's not being particularly rude to his mother as such, but he is questioning whether anybody should be, anybody human should be dictating to him what he should do when. And I think the reason for reading it in that way is because actually again and again in John's Gospel this is going to happen. And Jesus is very resistant to people, as it were, setting the chronology, the, the, the timing for things, or telling him what to do and how to do it. And actually, you know, when we were talking about it in the Bible study, somebody might quite rightly observe that... Um, you, if you go back to verse 3, when Jesus' mother is saying, they have no wine. Seeing the truth of the situation, naming the truth of the situation, is not the worst way for us to pray, actually. You know, sometimes when we pray and ask God to do something, we, we kind of give God the list of what he should do and when he should do it and how he should do it. Whereas perhaps prayer is rather more about us giving to God our perception and our understanding and our truth actually about how people are feeling and what's going wrong and maybe we don't know the answer. We don't know what the solution is, but we give it to God for God to act 
in his own good time and by his sovereign will. So when Jesus is almost slightly rebuking Mary, on the surface of it, on the surface of the story, it's a kind of a, a human exchange, but I think it is pointing to something bigger. It is pointing to this point that for Jesus' glory to be revealed, for Jesus to be seen to be God with him and God in him, it was not for human beings to, as it were, call the shots. And he does, after all, see in the second half of verse 4, this very interesting phrase, my hour has not yet come. And Whereas I already said that on the third day is not a particularly pregnant phrase in John's Gospel. The hour coming, wow, that is certainly a pregnant phrase in John's Gospel. We're going to hear that quite often as this Gospel goes on. All the way up to chapter 12, we're going to have a sense that the time has not yet come. And then once we get to chapter 13 of John's Gospel, the time absolutely has come. So... The hour has not yet come. Jesus really now, as it were, takes the, the everyday exchange about the lack of wine at this particular wedding in Cana of Galilee truly onto another plane. And at this point, we are definitely meant to see that this is a, well, this was a sign, the beginning of the signs, as John's Gospel tells us. Because ultimately, Jesus' hour was his was his death on the cross for us all. Ultimately, that was the hour. The hour in which the glory was absolutely decisively revealed as he died on the cross for us. But uh, even though we don't know all about that yet, as it were, because we're reading it this in sequence, we are just being given a sign, a pointer, that... Jesus has come to do decisive, huge things, not just for guests at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, but for the world and for all time. And uh, it has to follow the order, the timing, the plan which God has in mind. But here we are. In John chapter 2 just, my hour has not yet come. We're going to have to just sit with that, live with it. But actually rather beautifully, as it were, we're just brought straight back down to earth by verse 5 because his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> and, you know, it's both a gorgeously human moment of Mary saying, oh, well, you know, we'll just have to go with, with, with what my son wants uh, and is ready to do in a human narrative kind of sense, yes. But also, I think actually, as, as we pondered when we were all together, there is something there to evoke. It's an evocation of trust, isn't it? I mean, Mary does trust Jesus. Mary is ready to trust Jesus. And because the whole theme of this gospel is believing in Jesus, <coughs> I think it's rather gorgeous that his own mother clearly was on that. His own mother clearly was ready to believe in him. Although at this point in the story, of course, at this point in history, she didn't know, she did not know all that was yet to come. Should we go on? You see why we're only going to get through uh, uh, half, of the, half of the chapter. At this point, we, we, we pick up the pace a little bit because we now get the, we're, we're now just very much at, at the level of this ordinary wedding, even though it was the beginning of the signs, now that we think about it. But the story is that, well, there was these six stone jars. Uh, the Jews would always wash their hands. They would wash their utensils. Uh, ritual washing was very, very important for them to, uh, as a mark of their, uh, of uh, keeping holy, keeping pure before God. Um, and uh, at this point, it's these ceremonial washing jars, these huge things. And I showed a slide of uh, one from the first century that they found in Cana, uh, the place they think is Cana of Galilee, uh, most interestingly. Um, uh, uh, these huge jars um, uh, filling 
uh, filling it to the brim, Jesus says, uh, fill it up with, with water to the brim. Now, um, at a superficial level, of course, this is where the wine is going to come from. We, we, we know that because we, we, we've read the story. Um, there's also the sense that, you know, what we're dealing with here, and uh, I, I'm going to uh, go for this deep line uh, because, again, we've got every reason to have this deep line given what happens in the second half of chapter two and then what happens in chapter three and what happens in chapter four and so on, is that we've got a sense of the old being displaced by the by the new. So the old is where people would ceremonially wash and make themselves pure and do all the right things to fulfill all righteousness and yet be sinners still and yet be, we, they hoped, acceptable to God, uh, trusting in God's forgiveness. But now Jesus himself is, is ultimately actually the, the new wine. Uh, but what happens in the story is that the old is replaced by the new water, is replaced by, by wine. Filled to the brim, take the old as far as it will go, but then draw out of that something new. Drawing out, actually, uh, uh, that verb in, in verse 8, uh, it's just like drawing out of a well. And we're going to have quite a lot about a well and water uh, in chapter four of John's Gospel. But just for just now, we're going to draw out wine from the from these alabaster jars. It was remarkable wine. It was very good wine. It wasn't even just very ordinary, mediocre wine. And of course, there you have and again a sense that in the sign, in the pointer that this all this was about, this was not just a uh, a wee conjuring trick. This was not just a colouring of water or a, or a quick sleight of hand. This was about something on a completely different scale, on a completely different level. Um, it's a wee bit strange, as I've already said, when you step back to think about it, that Jesus should have given people who were already drinking far, far too much uh, even more to drink. Well, actually, it's not really about that, is it? It's really, now that we think about it, it's about the way in which his wine, his rich wine, where the cup overflows, where God fills our lives to the brim with his goodness, with his love, it's pointed to. And so, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first, the beginning of the signs through which he revealed his glory. And after this, no longer a counting of days, do you notice that? So the, the episode is as it were self-contained, uh, no longer a need in John's Gospel to count the days because as it were the, the whole story is glimpsed almost in a nutshell. What will it be like in, in the eternal kingdom when a, a new heaven and a new earth come? Uh, it will be like a, a wedding feast with the, the richest of wine, Isaiah 25. But um, for now, yeah, let's leave that big, big thought and let's just be told after a few, after this, they, they went off to Capernaum. And uh, we know Jesus did a lot in Capernaum, down by the Sea of Galilee. And he had his mother, he had his brothers, he had, we think, just five disciples at that time. And they stayed there a few days. Well, I'm going to just basically finish there because I want to keep this all manageable and we, we decided on Wednesday that we would really basically just do the first half. But if I may, I just want to just show you the beginning of the next bit. We're going to read about it being the time that Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple courts people selling cattle, sheep, doves and so on and he drove them out with a whip made of cords. He caused enormous commotion. Now, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, this account of him cleansing the temple, as it's become known, is all always recounted at the time that Jesus came into Jerusalem near, his, near the time he was arrested and crucified, very near to the time he was arrested 
and crucified. So it is kind of strange to find it here in chapter 2 of John's Gospel, a long, long way away from the time that Jesus was arrested and crucified. So that's given the scholars a lot of puzzlement because does that mean that uh, John's got the chronology wrong? Uh, when did this happen? Did it happen at the end of Jesus' ministry? Did it happen at the beginning? Uh, some people, in fact, some very respected commentators, have wondered whether Jesus even cleansed the temple twice, whether he did it actually at the beginning, say around AD 28, and maybe did it again four or five years later, uh, around AD 33. And one of the reasons for thinking that is that John's Gospel tells us that Jesus attended the Passover in Jerusalem on several occasions. And uh, so it's not impossible. In fact, it's actually even quite plausible. However, there is also a wee bit of reason to think that it does sound awfully like the same incident, the one that John's Gospel tells and the one that Matthew, Mark and Luke recount. And so probably the weight of opinion inclines to thinking that it only ever happened once. Um, I think all I want to say, as it were, as a taster for next week is that without us really, in a sense, being absolutely sure what the real chronology was, whether Jesus did cleanse the temple twice, which is not impossible, um, especially if it was some years apart, one from another, because things, as we all know, things tend to re-establish themselves. People forget, people start doing the same old things again. Uh, so it's quite possible he did it twice. But if he just did it once, has John got it wrong? I suspect not, actually, because I kind of slightly favour the, the, the view that Jesus only cleansed the temple once. But I don't see anything here from verse 13 onwards that tells us that this happened just then and there, immediately after they'd gone down to Capernaum. I mean, certainly it does talk about time for the Jewish Passover, but there's no particular relation in this second half of chapter 2 to the chronology of the first half of chapter 2. Um, it might be simply, as it were, leaping from the beginning of the signs, which I've already suggested points ultimately to Jesus being crucified and being resurrected, and indeed to the, the glory that awaits us all at the end of time, through faith. There's a connection between the first half of chapter 2 and the second half of chapter 2, because this actually was that for which Jesus was ultimately accused and put to death, claiming that the temple would fall and that he himself would bring it to be put together again. Um, I'm slightly anticipating this passage, but I'm just going to jump just to, before we leave this, see in verse 23, while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. Now, we've only ever been told so far about one sign. And uh, maybe the word signs might be used slightly differently here. It might be referring to something else. But I think verse 23 also kind of confirms what I've been saying about the chronology being perhaps two separate things. It's a little hard to be sure because even verses 24 and 25, which come here, do seem to link very clearly with, with chapter 3. So we are in a little bit of a conundrum, but well, this is Bible study. We need to note some of the, the wee problems and think hard about them. But I hope you appreciate what we've done today. We've tried to, to take a passage that most certainly tells a powerful, memorable story, a story about the, the beauty of a wedding, the gorgeous thing that there is when a, a man and a woman are united as one flesh. But it pointed to more. It pointed to more. Because Jesus was more. <laughs> he was the one through whom God acted, and in whom God was. Shall we pray? And so, Father, bless us as we have your word. 
Bless us as we have a word to chew over and to talk about, see new things in, to see the new wine that is you. Sometimes this contrast between the old and the new is one that we find difficult. Lord, may we always see the new belongs to you, that you are the one who makes things new. You are the one who, who both treasures that which has been handed down, but also brings it alive for here and now. You call us, even us, to follow and to believe. And so in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we'll continue with chapter two next week. Thank you for listening.